Come on, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. And let us exalt his name together. Come on, if you really love the Lord and he's been good, why don't you give him the best praise that you have? Come on, that's not good enough. We're talking about your Savior, your Lord, your King. Come on, open your mouth and bless thou the Lord in the house today. presence of the Lord. Uh, what a pleasure and an honor it is to be in this cathedral in Middle Georgia today. Uh, Pastor Kevin talked about it before, but uh, I've known him almost all of my life, and this is definitely a full circle moment. It's so good to see all of you, your smiling faces, and to our virtual audience. God bless you as well. There is a word from the Lord, and it's so good to see our visitors from the 4th Episcopal District. I have some amazing friends in the 4th, so it is a pleasure to see you as well. Shall we pray? Kind and gracious Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for giving us the ability to get up, wake up, and show up in your tabernacle this morning. We ask that you anoint these lips of clay and open the ears of that same material that we may be ever able to hear your word and apply it to our lives. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Uh, for the few moments that I have with you, I would like for us to center ourselves around a certain scripture. Uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verses 29 through 31. Isaiah 40, verses 29 through 31. And I am reading from the King James Version, so yours may read a little different. And thank you to our music ministry and this media ministry for getting us right this morning. Verse 29. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Verse 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. For a few moments that we have together, I would like to center us around the sermon topic of the wait was worth it. The wait was worth it. When thinking about this season that God has us in right now, the only word that I can think of is patience. Patience through the trials of life, patience through unemployment, patience through COVID, patience through school, patience, the ability to withstand. So before I get into this message this morning, wherever you are, in your car, in your bedroom, cooking Sunday dinner in the sanctuary with me, I'll take a survey and ask you, your pastor won't have to know, but sometimes I wonder, do you get sick and tired of waiting? Waiting for food to come out of the microwave, waiting to be old enough to do this or to do that, waiting for folks to let you over on a busy highway, waiting for final grades to come in, waiting for a package to come back from Amazon, waiting on folks to act right, get right, stay right. Y'all, sometimes I get tired of waiting. And truth be told, we can all be a little impatient. Honestly, I can be a little impatient. So this word is not just for you. The word might be for me today as well. In my high school, English class, we learned about homophones. Homophones. Homophones are two or more words having the same pronunciation, but different meanings, origins, or spelling. And you see that in our sermon title that is displayed on the screen. For the time that we have together, I would like us to focus on two homophones, wait and wait, wait and wait, wait, W-A-I-T, to stay where one is or delay action until a particular time or until something else happens, wait, W-E-I-G-H-T. How heavy an object may be or the counterbalance of an object against another opposing force. Wait and wait. 
My brothers and sisters, there is a commonality to each of our separate realities, and that is sometimes the weight gets the best of us. We try with all of our might to do right and to live right and to serve right, but sometimes things just go wrong and we have to wait. It seems that the moment our prayers get answered, we are forced to once again into another trial waiting for God to answer. If it can't go wrong, it will go wrong, and it has gone wrong. If the car isn't in the shop, the refrigerator stopped working. If the refrigerator doesn't stop working, the AC stops working. If the AC doesn't stop working, we get a bad report from the doctor. And Pastor Kevin, sometimes it just gets hard to wait. We feel like we are about to crumble, and on top of all that, we are commanded by God to wait and to be of good courage. But I came to encourage someone in here listening that the wait was worth it. The wait, the wait was worth it. This storm won't take you under. The sinking sand beneath you won't do you in. This sickness is not unto death. The wait is going to be worth it. The wait is going to be worth it. Tell your neighbor, the wait is worth it. The wait, the wait is worth it. At Morehouse, each of our academic departments had that one professor. That one professor that seemed like they woke up every morning just to fail any and every student that they came in contact with. It seemed like purposefully they taught in a way that made the simple lessons hard and the hard lessons unbearable. They were tough, y'all. They were heavy. They were weighty because we had to be able to show that we could stand the weight and live worthy of being called a Morehouse man. If the student can stand the weight of pop quizzes and stand the weight of office hours and the weight of long nights and early mornings, they would get their reward because they understood that the weight was worth it. And I wonder who I'm talking to in this building that says I may not have a bachelor's, a master's, a doctoral degree, a GED, but I have been in the school of life and I've been waiting for some answers. I feel, I feel like I've been waiting for a mighty long in your desolation to tell you that the wait will be worth it. You can do it. You can make it. Just hang on in there. You can endure the wait so you can get your reward. And here we stand. Here we sit in our text. We see the children of Israel and Hezekiah once again in another battle. Once again feeling like many of us do right now. If it ain't one thing child is another. The story of Hezekiah is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Your pastor said you're getting ready to start VBS and these are the kind of characters that you learn about in Vacation Bible School so I implore you come to Vacation Bible School. That was just a shameless plug. That was just a shameless plug. The story of Hezekiah is one of victories and violent defeat of success and loss. A story of warnings and wailings, ups and downs, loud questions and sometimes a silent God resounding yeses and resolute noes, prophecies and proclamations. The story of Hezekiah is a mess. It's a hot mess because he's under a whole lot of weight and it seems like God has left him all alone. Is there anybody out there today that can testify sometimes life gets a little weighty and it feels like God has left me all alone. I prayed and I cried. I cried and I prayed. I fasted and yet I'm still all alone. Israelites have been in battle after battle. Jericho, Judea, Babylon, the Red Sea, Ai, and now waiting in the valley of Moab. Can you imagine what it must be like to be the children of Israel? Constantly fighting time after time. Losing loved ones, using resources, packing up your family just because God said so. Tested time and time again. Waiting and if we be honest, 
in St. Paul this morning. We are like Hezekiah and the children of Israel. Though we are not in 600 BC, Isaiah's words ring louder and louder, enough for us to hear. And beloved of God, I submit to you that when reading this text, there are a few things that encourage us for how to endure the wait. How to endure the wait. Number one, work in the wait. Work in the wait. Look at your name and tell them, work in the wait. Work in the wait. Work in the wait. Work in the wait. That neighbor didn't respond right. Turn to your other neighbor, tell them, neighbor, work in the way. March 14th, 2020, my birthday, the country shut down because of what we know as the coronavirus, COVID-19. The world was in a panic, waiting for a vaccine, waiting for answers, pressured under the weight of being stuck at home, pressured under the weight of facing demons we thought we really had conquered, held down under the weight of being around abusive family members. We lost a lot, y'all. We learned a lot. And as a result of all that, we found ourselves asking God, how much longer must we wait? Church went virtual, hospitals became overrun, college students went home, graduations became online, movie theaters became ghost towns, parks became overrun with grass and, and foliage. And the thing that hurt me the most was that gyms shut down. The gym shut down. I know you can't tell it today, but before the pandemic, I was relatively fit. Relatively fit, you know. I had a 32 waist, I had muscles and pecs, and I could run at least two miles That physique came at a price. And now that things are opening back up, I kind of see how out of shape I have got. The price of looking good was working out. And I can tell you about how hard it was to do cable crunches and squats. I can tell you how difficult it was for me to run two miles in 15 minutes. I can tell you it was hard doing mountain climbers and heavy skull crushers. And that would all be the truth. But that wouldn't be the whole truth. My real issue wasn't the weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, of the dumbbells. No, it wasn't my own body mass pressing against my joints. No, it was, it was the weight, the W-A-I-T, of the results. Waiting to see the results, I put myself through every time I went to the gym. Waiting and working to only lose five pounds. Seeing other folks who were just naturally athletic snap their bodies back in shape. Seeing people with six packs and I couldn't even, even get one pack. And I wondered why it was taking so long. And my trainer said something prophetic and he didn't even know it. He said, if you stop looking at other people's progress, you might be able to make some progress of your own. You might get some new strength. And the Bible says in verse 29, he gives strength to the weary and increases power to the weak. My trainer said, the reason it seems like it's taking so long is you keep coming in here, looking at other people instead of maintaining so you can get your own results. I became weary. I wasn't working my weight, W-A-I-T. While I waited for the results, I was supposed to eat right and get rest and drink water, and I did none of that. I thought I could just come into the gym, work my behind off, and everything would be okay, and it doesn't work like that. And child of God, it's the same thing in our lives. Sunday morning is the weight room. Sunday morning is the weight room. And you come in here, and you shout, and you dance, and holler. First problem comes around, oh Lord, I can't make it. I, I, I just don't know what I'm going to do. You got to work your weight. Work that waiting period and trust God. The Bible recorded that Hezekiah was the same way. Hezekiah's issue wasn't that the weight was too heavy. It was that he kept looking at everything around him while he was waiting. The battle wasn't hard. War was something that he was used to. He knew how to do it. It was that he was given the command stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And I don't have an issue with the problems of life, God. You can just space them out a little bit more if I be honest. I'm sick of going through one thing, coming out of one problem and going into the next problem. 
problem. So some of you can say just like that to life for me ain't been no crystal stair. My daddy wasn't there. My family didn't love me. I grew up poor. I couldn't go to college. I felt like the black sheep of my family. God, I know you're going to come through, but does it just take your soul home? It just takes your soul home. It's not the workout that's hard. It's the waiting that's the issue. Why you wait? You have to keep following God's laws, living right, and don't slip. To do what he says in verse 29, God will be right there to renew your strength. Number one, we must work our weight. W-A-I-T. Number two, we must wield our weight. Wield our weight. This is not the same weight as number one. Number one is W-A-I-T. The second one is talking about weight mass. To wield is just a 30 word with a three cent meaning that basically means to hold something. While in school, I had to take a physical science class, y'all. While in this class, we learned about architecture and skyscrapers, specifically the Sears Tower in Chicago. This work of steel is 110 stories high. It is one of the tallest buildings in the world and the second tallest building in North America. But what intrigued me the most about this building was not its height. It wasn't the thousands of glass panels that are all over the building. It wasn't even the glass elevator that sits on the exterior of the building. What intrigued me was the foundation, its build, its structure, and its joints. Its joints. Family, lean in just for a moment here. The Sears Tower was built with what we call a bundle tube structure. This is a system where to resist lateral loads like extreme wind and earthquake and major impact, a building is designed to act like a hollow cylinder at its joints and sway ever so slightly as to bend but never break. The strategic assembly of columns and beams forms a rigid frame around the building to form a dense and strong structure at the exterior. So no matter what hits the building, the building will still be okay. Y'all not listening. The master builder knows every bolt, support beam, restroom, faucet, the complete design and weight of the building. It is just dependent on a few joints. Because, because the master builder is so good, he plays every joint in a way that if one joint gave up, the whole structure wouldn't collapse. Y'all not getting me today. Every day the building bends, but it doesn't break. Some help tell your pastor, talk to your parents, go 
guardians or find somebody to help you put words to your pain because it is okay not to be okay. The weight gets heavy and sometimes you have to hold it even though you can't lift it and you got to wield your weight because you sometimes fall. My last point and I'm done. If we are going to endure the weight not only must we work the weight, not only must we wield the weight, but we have to wait for the weight. W-A-I-T for the W-E-I-G-H-T. Verse 31 says, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The eagle is a special bird. The eagle has specialized feathers designed for high altitude flight. These special wings are called remiges. They provide most of the lift the eagle needs by overlapping to form an efficient airflow or a jet stream. This jet stream allows the eagle to pierce through the weight of gravity and shoot it to the air. The eagle is the only bird that can fly directly into the eye of a storm and come out again. Physics says the eagle shouldn't be able to fly. Physics says eagles shouldn't be able to outrun a storm. Physics says that eagles should be on the grounds like chickens. But when eagles get ready to fly, they don't think about it. They just mount up into the air.